We're live. Hi, Tonka says we're live. So welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, we've got a good show for you. Um, Manny Lines was supposed to be here tonight. He's built an observatory up in um, North Central California, and he was going to show us the progress he's made and some of the decisions he made and stuff like that. But something came up where um, it was a good news. He had the graduation kind of party um, to go to, so he couldn't be here tonight. One of the things that happened um, about a year, year and a half ago is we um, started organizing ourselves so that we would always be able to fill in at the last minute. So uh, the people that you see normally around here, Eric and Tolga and me and um, Terry and Molly, we all have what we call a show in our back pocket. So we can do, we're all, all ready to give a show. Um, and Terry has stepped forward and he's going to be giving us a show tonight about um, some strategies he's come up with for collecting data that makes it more efficient. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing tonight. If you came to hear about the observatory build, that's uh, Manny's going to be back in July to tell us about that. But for now, uh, let me... Um, let me share my screen if I can here. Wake up, screen sharing thing, present now. My entire screen. And um, uh, obviously you should go to the Astro Imaging channel now and then. There's a lot of interesting things here. And um, we one of the things we wanna show you is our calendar. Um, next week, Bob Zellum is going to be here, a little bit of citizen science. He's going to tell us about how to use your current pretty picture astroimaging gear to hunt for exoplanets. It doesn't take a whole evening to do some of these searches he's talking about. It just takes a little bit of your evening every now and then to do that. Uh, Bob Traub is going to come along next week after that, tell us about uh, uh, comet processing using PixInsight. And then Richard Wright's going to come back and tell us about Sky Fusion, which is a new device that the software BIS people are putting together. Uh, we've got some other sh good shows coming up, um, and I'm sure you'll be interested in them. And we are always looking for presenters. So if you'd like to tell us something about you've learned in astroimaging, um, we, hey, we'd love to hear from, from you. You know, if you've got something you can contribute to the to the general good of the astroimaging community, please come on over and look for our links here and under links. Oh, no, 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 don't look there. Look under contact. There we go. That's what I'm going to go to. And just contact us and tell us, hey, I've been working on developing a so-and-so and such and such, and I'd like to tell you about it. We'd really uh, appreciate hearing from you on that. Also, when on YouTube here, I'll make YouTube bigger so you can see it better. Um, and shut that off. Um, you can see that we've already got a bunch of people over here. This is the safe astronomy meeting that you can still go to. And so welcome to come on into the to the astronomy meeting here. And, um, you know, no social distancing required or anything like that. So we're going to get everybody here for you every um, Sunday night for the duration and long thereafter, we hope. Um, with all that in mind, I'm going to present to you, um, I'm going to stop sharing. Oops, where'd that go? Oh, I know. I, that's one of the problems. Now I got to go back over here. I'm going to stop presenting over here, go back to my other screen. And Terry, it's about time for you to take over. Tell us who you are and what you got to tell us about tonight. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You're not sharing your screen yet, though. Yeah, it takes a long time yep. on, the other, on the other side of the planet. Okay. How about now? Oh, uh, all the way from Australia. Yes. You're, you're just starting to present now. Yeah, it's got to traverse the Pacific full of sharks. Okay. Is it up there? Up there yet? Yes, yes. It is. it's up. Oh, okay. So t what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, a way I use to obtain data uh, several years ago. Right now, I do most of my acquisition. Uh, from a remote observatory. But before that, I used to do everything mobile. I, ha I have an observatory in the backyard. I would gut it, take everything out, to out into the bush, and I would start imaging and then bring it all back home and put it back in the, do in the dome. So a bit of an introduction of who I am. I started this hobby back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, when I first came to Australia, 
back then astronomy gear was incredibly expensive. So I actually built all of my stuff. My first real telescope was a eight inch split ring equatorial mount that I could disassemble and put into my little mini. The OTA was inside the, t inside the car itself and the mount was on top of the car and I would go driving down the freeway with this thing that was mostly telescope in a tiny, tiny car. The drive system was a friction drive with a viscous coupling. I made all the ring gears, um, the worm gears. I've hobbed all those by hand. I also made all the electronics to control the mount. Yeah, I also ground. I also made um, both refractors and mirrors. And I was starting this all back when this very interesting media called film. This is some early work that I did back in the very early 90s. This is uh, on a homemade mount that I constructed using, at first when I started, I was doing piggyback photography. And uh, so it's not quite as vibrant as we get nowadays, but we only had one shot and we had to deal with things like film reciprocity and stuff that we don't deal with now. Uh, this is also some early work in the 90s. This is one of the, I think it's probably the second telescope I built. This is a uh, refractor for imaging. And it, it actually worked fairly well. Again, using this drive system that I constructed that was a viscous coupling friction drive. Many years later, lots of cold nights. Another decade had passed and uh, like everybody, I made a lot of errors. But I was learning. What did I learn? Well, one of the first things, this astronomy gig is really not that easy. There's a lot of things you have to get right. Stuff will always go wrong and it will go wrong. And when it goes wrong, it just seems to cascade over and over. And then you get frustrated and you have to come back and start again. Terry? But, yes. Uh, Tonga, could you recenter the, the image that we're broadcasting on YouTube? I just texted him. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, so I need to start over. Do I need to start yeah, over? It's just, no. it's just a little bit shifted off off to. Uh, he needs to move it like the selected portion of the screen over to the left a bit because uh, your side's just getting cut off a bit. Um, yeah, so. I think I think you're actually doing fine. Uh, I think we yeah, can figure out what was on the edges, but it was interesting watching the little the little. Um... Anyway, Tolga's going to fix it. He's going to get in yeah, the lab and fix it. It's fixed. Okay, back. Yeah, it's fixed. Yeah, sorry. Okay. About that. No, 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 no problem. Um, so I, if I was to give any advice to anybody starting off in this would be to find yourself an imaging partner, someone who is around the same level or even mentoring and work with them. You can learn a lot. I have an imaging partner. And once I started doing this, uh, what I, you know, I started to be able to do more and more because I could bounce ideas off somebody and you start getting very good ideas. If you want to really progress, Work with somebody. Record everything. Don't rely on your memory. My memory is terrible. I have to write stuff down. <laughs> and there's going to be a few repetitive things here, and one of them is testing. And you have to test everything before you go imaging. And with testing, if you are a remote imager, this is at a completely different level because there's nobody around to actually pick things up when something goes wrong. With mobile and both remote imaging, I would actually construct a toolkit for your Astro setup. If you are into automobiles or other things, you have your own tools for that, that's fine. But I would make a separate toolkit that has all the things that you always require for that and only use it for that. So when you go to the field, you pick it up, you take it with you, and you know those things that you require in there. Uh, spares are essential. Stuff goes wrong. So when I do my purchasing, I generally purchase two of everything. Things take a very long time to get here. A lot of us order things from China. They can take several months. So I generally order two or three. And um, when something faults, you have a replacement straight away. You don't have to wait or go sourcing something. And stuff is very expensive in this hobby. Do your research, chat to people, find out what you're, what you're buying and only buy it once. Okay. Yeah, the most valuable thing you have is time, and we don't have enough of it. And this is why you got to make effective use of it when you're out in the field. Without it, you're not going to make any real headway, and you're going to become very, very frustrated. 
all your planning needs to be completed before you venture out. You don't want to have thinking on the fly where, when you're out, the, out in the dark. Have all your equipment issues sorted before you leave, and you don't want to be debugging in the dark. It's not very productive. Get everything working before you leave. At this point, I'm going to stop uh, and see if there's any questions. Any questions? Uh, I've been monitoring um, uh, YouTube, and it looks like it's just the the usual visiting that goes on amongst the the okay. fans of the Astro Imaging Channel. Molly has made a comment that uh, she's got a special toolbox uh, for all of her parts and gizmos and stuff like that, and they always go out together. I right. also have the same kind of thing. So. Yeah, and it sounds very simple, but it, it's actually quite important. Um, the worst mistake I made was I brought everything except my imaging PC. <laughs> it's very embarrassing, <laughs> and I know I will I will admit it. I, I mucked up, but now I now when I go, I actually have a spare PC. I just bring two PCs with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, these are common threads for both mobile and permanent observatories. The way I, I tend to approach things is I like to break up all of my target acquisition into small little blocks. I always try to image on straight up. This is very important. And I'll tell you why a little further down the, down the road. Work with the schedule. Have your schedule planned in advance and try to stick with it because you're trying to make effective time, use of your time. If you start deviating, you're going to lose time. You're going to miss out on an opportunity. I like to think of the skies or the cosmos, cosmos as a great big clock. And it's certainly not going to wait around while you're sitting there debugging and trying to figure out all those USB things that you should have rectified at home. Your target's going to come and go, and you're going to lose it. And be realistic about what you can accomplish in one night. It's a rewarding hobby if you do that. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. And you can't image everything in one night. Just take your time. If you don't, If you don't finish it, come back the next year. I, I've gone as long as four years, but that's a bit extreme. Not everybody's willing to do that. And we're going to expand imaging on the zenith. As I mentioned, treating the sky as a conveyor belt that brings objects to you. So you're just basically pointing straight up, and as things come over, you're picking them off all the time. All good things will come to those who wait using this approach. I, I have a system where I would break targets up over a three month over a three month cycle. So this sounds a little bit wacky, but I would at the beginning of the night I would have something called the end of an image plan. This is the first imaging session that you're doing at the night. At this point, you're looking straight up. This is the tail end of the previous month's plan. We'll get into this a bit further. Then I have something called the middle of a plan which is midway through the night and the beginning of an image plan, which is the last imaging session, but the beginning of a new plan for this three month rotation. Big question mark. It's not, it, it does make sense when, if you think about it. So we have, we have three parts of the night, the beginning, the middle and the end. The first plan of the night, at astronomical dark, you're looking straight up or slightly west when you're chasing objects or filling holes from your previous month. Midway through the night is when you are, um, things are in the most favorable position. This is, represents the, the targets that are prime for this, this month. And the beginning of the image plan is the last plan of the night, which will be the start of next month's best Object. We'll get into this. It sounds a bit, a bit interesting or a bit confusing, but we'll try to make it a little bit more clear. Okay, so we're going to start at the beginning or the end of the image plan. So this represents your first imaging session. Remember, things are coming to you. So this guy, our friendly observer, is going to be imaging straight up at twilight. This is where you're reinforcing all the holes that you had in your data set. You might not have had enough blue, or you might have you might want to get something that you've missed. You can finish that off. This is your last chance to correct any issues with your target sets for this season. And again, you want to focus on the meridian. 
This is where you're finishing off your target. You can bolster luminance because luminance is the most important thing, as you've always heard. You'll know this because you would have looked at your data. You have done some pre, uh, preliminary image processing. You look. You can look at it. You can see, you just identify where it's weak. If you're doing color, you can use staircase or just cycle through the different colors. So if you're more of a, a longer imager, longer focal length, like galaxies and stuff, you probably want to use a staircase. So you're starting red, green, blue, blue, green, red. If you're more of a wide field person, you can probably just simply cycle through your colors. Again, you're working at, on the zenith to minimize star bloat. Before I started doing this, I was always chasing targets. And when I would get back, I would look at my data, I would have big bloaty blue stars and other other stars which were nice and crisp. And then when you, when you combine your color, you'd have all these really wacky halos that were very hard to fix. What we're trying to do here is get rid of that. So when you do your image processing, that's one less thing you have to worry about. Okay, we're going to stop here, ask if there's any questions. Eric, have you any questions? Just a lot of chit chat over on uh, YouTube so far. Okay. I'm sorry, Terry. I was trying to get my white, white band so I could hit my microphone. <laughs> I think a lot of people in their frustration of, of going out and, and not having things that they need while they're there. Common experience from all of us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's something you, we can, a, we can you've alter. You've had a nerve. You've had a nerve there. Yeah. And we've all done it. Like I said, the worst for me was actually bringing everything with me except the PC. That was completely embarrassing. <laughs> it doesn't get worse than that. <laughs> there was one comment that I, uh, something I've used and I saw someone comment, and that is taking pictures of your rig when it's all set up. So if you have to reference it, you can yes. look at it, which we find more interesting than having to read your scribbles. And uh, labeling all of your ports. And that's another thing I, I mentioned later on as well is for consistency, label everything and plug it back into the same port. Hey, you okay. said something about, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, about your staircase method of RGBBGR versus Correct. RGB, RGB. What's the difference? Okay. If you're... Um, they all have to do with wavelengths. So as you drop down into the atmosphere with this, our friendly observer here, where he's pointing, if you are imaging, say, blue at that elevation, and then you are imaging red, a red star, you know, and you were to overlay them over one another, they're going to be huge discrepancy in sizes. But as you move up, the, refract the atmosphere, uh, there's a refraction occurring at that point, like a prism spreading out uh, the wavelength a bit more. But as you get up top, Less of that is happening with the planet with the planetary imagers. Remember, we had um, um, the guy from Cyprus with a little apparatus in his telescope that it was like a, a prism Agapio. apparatus. Yes, Agapio, where he was um, effectively trying to bring all of the spectra into one one place where it was mostly the same, not spread out. You're doing the same thing here as you come straight up your star sizes tend to be very similar sizes. But as you start dropping down, the atmosphere is starting to spread the light out more and more, and you get these huge discrepancies. You get bloaty, especially blue. Blue will tend to blow, blow it out quite a lot. And that's, pr that's pretty hard to fix post-processing. You can do it. You can do some deconvolution, maybe on that one channel before the combination into color, but then it'll overcompensate on other stars. You'll always see you'll always see an effect for it, but if you focus straight up, that effect is the least. Does that help? Right, but I, I just don't understand how are they changing the. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so see where he is there. So if you started with this, what's called a staircase method, you start on the red. Red is more forgiving there, and as you move further up, you change to green, and then. Uh, a bit more time, your telescope's almost pointing straight up. You then do the blue, 
the next blue channel, and then as you go over the meridian, you're going off to the west, then you go back to green, and then eventually back to red. And they will, and if that is probably the most effective strategy of getting them closest if you if you didn't want to do it all straight up. And that's more apparent on a longer focal length instrument. Right. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it a, would make sense if you wanted to shoot your Bs up high and then the yeah. Gs and the Rs down low. But if yeah. you're switching, if you're going R G B and B G R, and just keep repeating that, I don't know if you're accomplishing that. Is that no, 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 that, that that's that's just for one session, right? That's just for one go. So you're doing red, green, and blue straight up, and then back to green, then to red. Oh, so okay. Yeah. So you're only taking six pictures. Correct. Correct. Yeah, just oh, for that you, one. Got cause, you, cause, got cause, got yeah, because yeah, because we're actually dividing the night up into three three sections. Okay. So right now we're in the uh, I guess the prime. This is the middle of the image plan. What I would call this is your prime target. That's up tonight. You know, this month you're you're photographing, uh, your your you know the that one object you want to get. You're going to do him on the meridian as well, uh, and uh, at this point we're going to have less air mass, right? Right, right. So this, yeah, and this represents the prime target. We should also have by this time we're going to have less turbulent air. At the beginning of the night, we're going to have. I don't know about where you are, but when here, just after sunset, the atmosphere is pretty choppy. And especially if you're trying to chase things down into the west, not a really good strategy. You get you get pretty yucky data, so you do want to come back and image straight up. But in the middle of the night, this is your prime target for this month. The atmosphere is going to be less turbulent. You're going to have less satellites as well because they're going to be in the in the Earth's shadow. And this is where it becomes a bit of a judgment call. If if conditions turn soft, which they can do, you can always swap to color because color is really not that important. You can get by with some pretty pretty average looking color data. Okay, so the beginning of the image plan, this is at the tail end of the night. So this stuff is actually typically below the horizon when you started at the very beginning of the night. Again, we're going to be imaging straight up here. Be flexible. If you got one of those incredible nights where the air is super, super steady, do your luminous at that point. Or you can start filling in color data. But I would typically look at where I'm imaging because some areas of the sky, you have a lot more satellites. I, you, know, you may want to put your luminance the following night. Just do a bit of research on what you're going to be imaging. Because you know from past experience, certain parts of the skies, you can have a lot more issues with, with stuff floating about. Um, as I said here, uh, this, this contains next month's prime position. So this is all about, there's a bit of risk involved here because you may miss the opportunity where you do have weather that's blocked it. So just go with what you have. With the, as you start doing this, you end up with a full data set every time you go out because that this 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 one here uh you uh, well, what's the best way of putting this um it takes a little bit to get into it but but once you start doing this sort of thing every month you're kicking in you you're kicking out objects but it's all from the best part of the sky um luminance is more important you can get by with surprising little color data a lot of the shots i do i might only have one hour of color data and i might have 10 or 15 hours of luminance data i don't seem to have a problem with color um, you can get your color data and blur the crap out of it when you're processing and uh, the luminance data is what really makes things look very smooth always have an alternate plan programmed ready to go if you're if you're using something like uh, CCD autopilot or one of those other sorts of packages you can have several plans already programmed into it and you can always have an alternate in case you decide to change your mind and as we move into the morning satellites will become more of an issue so this all sounds pretty complicated so why do it this way well gradients you know pretty evil they can introduce an extra challenging processing thing that you don't really want to deal with. 
There are fewer gradients on the zenith, but you will get a bit of sky glow. Uh, but I know all you excellent image processors out there can really deal with that quite well. Imaging on the meridian, star sizes are what you're trying to attack here. It's just one thing that you can actually take care of as opposed to trying to do it in the processing, which always seems to leave artifacts. Um, your mantra really should be image on the zenith. I know it sounds a bit, you probably heard me say this many times, plan your targets in advance. When you first rock up, do, you can do all of your polar alignment well before the sun has set. Um, depending on your mount manufacturer, you can, um, you can have it almost polar aligned just as the sun is um, ready to do your twilights, uh, do, ready to do your sky flats. Um, when I was imaging out there, I would be doing polar alignment while the sun was uh, still almost visible because I would see stars with the camera would actually pick up stars. We don't have a pole star here, so we do everything through drift alignment. Do that in twilight and then and then uh, start your, your flats. Test all your equipment, make diagrams, label your plugs and plug into the same ports. With PCs, every time you insert something into a USB, it has to record the serial number, the timestamp, if there's any files related to a USB device. There's a lot going on with USB. The best to plug it into the same port. If you plug it into an alternate port, it has to re-register that device and you risk something going wrong. So label everything, as Eric mentioned earlier, take a photograph, consult that photograph and make sure you do it exactly the same. That's something else that you can just be proactive with. Capitalize on your time by sticking with your plan. Uh, one of the things I always find quite comical when you have a large group of people on the field, there's people running around, what are you imaging tonight? Can you, can you recommend a target for me? That's not the place to do this. You should have it all worked out before you rock up. Uh, program your automation software to do obtain flats in the morning. If you've missed your evening flats, and then if you're staying for two nights, which is what I would typically do, I would uh, then do my twilight flats the next night. And that way I've got both sides of the meridian. Darks in your bias frames. Well, you can do these at home if you have a cooled camera. But if you don't have a cooled camera, the best strategy would be to simply take your darks at the end of your observing session. So if you have like a DSLR, put your lens cap on, set it up to do your darks, and just throw it in, in, in the boot of your car. I let it click until the battery flattens. Um, when you're back at home, look at your data, look for any funky issues that you can correct the following week, the following month when you decide to go out. Um, after a few months, you'll have all of these, all of these holes filled up. It takes a bit of time to get into it, but up, but at the end of the third month, you have a new data set to work with. That's very clean. And, and most important, your star sizes are more consistent because stars are the canary in the coal mine. If you look at anybody's astrophotography, looking at stars, you, um, that's the hardest thing to get right. Uh, address any hardware issues that you have before you go to the next uh, dark sky session. As I said earlier, polar line at dusk, you don't have to be able to see stars to do this. Your telescope will gather quite a lot of light. Um, have everything planned well in advance, not only a day. Uh, this frees up lots of time because you're sitting back relaxing while everybody else is running around still deciding on what to image that night. Um, it's not a race. It, plan and just have a lot of fun. You can just bring your favorite comfy chair, recline with your favorite beverage because you've planned for it and you can watch everybody else scrambling. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, any questions at this point? Well, I got my finger on the mic this time, so yes. Oh, cool, yes. So what are your thoughts about your stair-step approach with narrow band filters? Narrow band, not as important. Um, 
but if you're substituting color data in there, you'd want to do that for the for the broadband. But with the narrow band, I don't think there's much of I haven't seen much of a difference in mine. Have you? Because you do a lot of narrow band. No, not at all. No. Yeah. But the question was asked to our presenter, so it goes to you. Okay. Yep. 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 Um, I would only worry about this if you're doing broadband color color data. With a narrow band, your star sizes are pretty tiny. If you're overlaying your color data onto your narrow band data, your star sizes are huge in comparison. So you do yeah. want to make sure they're they're consistent because inconsistencies, when you go to process that, if you do deconvolution on one channel, your profile of that star, that stellar profile is going to change that one color channel channel. And but the other channels haven't been adjusted that way, and it's going to look odd. You're gonna, you could end up with a ringing effect or a depression. It's very, very hard to fix. So why and not just why not just get good data? So why do flats in the uh, early in the evening and then early in the morning? Ah, um, more uh, more flats the better, as always. But there could be a slight brightening on one side. And when you do it in the in the inverse, like morning and night, when you average the two together, they average out pretty well. Yeah, so I've done that so, myself. Sky flaps, you got to do them both morning and evening. Otherwise, yeah. you end up with gradients. Yeah, yeah. And the, if you go out on the weekend and you generally do the Friday and Saturday night thing, you do your you may not get your sky flats on the Friday night, but you could do them in the morning, and on the next night you can do your evening flats. And you have a, you have a complete set. So the question came up: Do you ever encounter molds that happen during the evening, so that your flats, you know, become a little invalid? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Um, that sounds like something is shifting in the image train if that's happening. Your filters may be rotating slightly, or they're not fixed in your filter wheel properly, or the filter wheel is not rotating it to the same position. That's what that sounds like to me. It sounds like a theoretical question to me. Oh, okay. Well, dust 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 can move on filter, so it's better yeah. to have flats uh, in the more in dusk and dawn, so that if something shifts during the night, because that can happen. It, it, yes. It's a little dust particle moves a little bit. Your donut's gonna move, so you you more likely to catch that if you have flats on both sides than if you only have one side. You know, if that's the case, you're gonna have a shadow if it actually moves. Because even averaging morning and evening, if your molt moves, it, it's no, just no, I'm not talking about a shadow. I'm talking you would use okay. mornings for a few subs and this uh, in night for the other ones because if you blink through your calibrated data and you you come across three or four that have shifted yeah maybe you could try just the the evening flats or the dawn flats and see if that cancels it out right that's what i'm saying yeah and you i guess everybody out there would know that you can tell where the particle is or get an estimation where it is by the size of it. There are calculators on the internet where you can see if it's on your chamber window, is it on a is it on a filter wheel or is it on a corrector? The size will change. You can get the distance from the sensor. I any, think that's any, all I see. Okay. Okay, so there's a few, few other things here. Um, this is a URL. If I click on that, this has to do with wind. Again, because I, I image at a couple meters, and uh, I'll leave that link up there. I'm just going to click on it. I'm going to slide this in. One sec. Okay, can you guys see that? The video? Yeah. Uh, not sure, Terry. No, you have to. You're you're presenting from your presentation, um, so you'd have to switch over to um, like stop presenting and then start presenting again on the video tab. Okay. Should I do that? Full screen. Okay. Let's let's give that a go here. I'll try not to break the internet. Okay. So um, you are presenting. Stop presenting. 
Okay. Yeah, you're presenting a single window. Yeah. Okay. Present a window. Or you can present your whole screen, so then when you flip back over, um, or you can just present the the one tab. That's fine too. Okay. That's quite a long choice choice here. <laughs> uh, so okay, so if I do this one, um, it doesn't actually come up with a window, unfortunately. Let's try this one here. Well, uh, your window would be your browser. Um, okay. The video. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, give it a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now we see your browser window. Right. Okay. So this is a this is me a few years back. Um, trying to deal with the wind. So this is this is setting up. So what I used to do, I have a, I had a dome in the backyard. I would gut the dome. I would take everything out of the dome, and then I would pack it in the car. And this is the astronomical society of Victoria's deep sky deep sky site. And they actually had some permanent piers in the ground, and uh, they have plans for plates. And I got one manufactured that would fit on top of that. And I would just put my mount on there, and uh, I'd have little tiny marks, like a vernier, and I could get it pretty close to calibration. Then I would do my polar alignment in the evening. But this is what I this was my approach to dealing with wind. This is about three hours to set this guy up. Okay, that's a uh, that's a ten inch um, Arcos. That little device there was those little things that you can sit under that have shade. So I took the roof off of it. I created some poles and this is shade cloth that runs around the perimeter of the instrument. So what this does, the worst thing you want to do is have a tarp. Tarp would be an evil thing to use to block wind because it actually increases the wind. This induces something like laminar airflow. When you're inside the tarp, there is a very slight breeze, but it's not buffeting. If you have a tarp around the perimeter, you will get wind up and over and hitting, and you'll actually you'll actually get a lot of uh, you'll actually induce a lot more movement. So this is a very this is a very cheap solution. So it was something like uh, I just bought a bunch of shade cloth, stuff like number thirty shade cloth, off eBay. Um, I bought one of these marquee things and I just modified it and um, it's pretty easy to erect. It was a very cheap solution and I could be imaging in very, very breezy conditions. I don't know if you, you saw the background here, but uh, I'm, I'm imaging at 2300 millimeters. You see the wind blowing there in the background? That presents no problem at all when I'm imaging with that, with that device. If I don't have that, I will to image. Okay, I'll see if I can stop that here. Hope. Am I sharing the full screen, guys, or just the window? If you share the full screen, then whatever you've got on your screen will come to us. Uh, mm -hmm. And Tolga would then have to readjust a little bit to make it work. But uh, if you share, you can share a particular window, and only that window will come to us. Okay. So I'm going to share an entire screen. And right now we're looking at, we're still looking at. Uh, well, he, he's. Uh, uh, yeah, we're not. It should and, be updating soon. And, and and just to confuse yeah. things, there's a 20 some second separation between <laughs> okay. the meeting and the YouTube. So. Okay. Uh, now uh, you, are we back to the thing? Yeah, you're back to your presentation. Yeah, okay. No, yeah. Okay. So that was the URL if anybody's interested in um, looking at that. That was a very, very cheap solution, very effective solution. Even when I was imaging with a, uh, a shorter instrument, I was using that thing as well. I had a 8-inch uh, F4 Vixen that I used to pop in there as well. And um, that's not nearly as critical as imaging at a couple of meters. But it might be something to, might be something to look at if wind is uh, giving you a problem. Other reliability. 
Um, ditch those cigarette connectors. They're just evil. You look at them and they just connect. If you can, replace them with something like an Anderson connector. There's, they're, they're used by the ham radio people. They're self-cleaning electrical connector. So when you plug them in, they actually clean themselves. And they will carry a lot of amperage. But the, but the default cigarette connectors are something you should just remove completely. Uh, power considerations. Uh, at, at that site, we did have mains power. But the way I would run it is I had my own UPS. I ran everything off batteries, and I had a UPS backing it up. So if the power tripped, I could keep on imaging. Cable management is something to really, really look at. You can have several shows on cable management, but that's going to have huge effects on things like guiding. Um, be comfortable. Get a, a nice table and chair and a hood around your laptop to protect it from dew in the wind. On the far side of that wind mechanism, I had a table set up with a little hood, and my laptop was in there. Uh, label all your cables, use the same ports as I said earlier, because every time you reinsert something to a different port, it has to go through re-registering, and that can give you a problem that you don't want out there. That's why you might have a USB dev device that works in one port, but not the other. And backing up your image, your imaging computer. There's several bits of software that you can get where you can image your PC. I treat my, imag my imaging PCs as a toaster. They do nothing except imaging. They don't surf the web. They don't do anything. And I do back them up. So if something false, I can restore it to a previous known good. Everything is up and running. I actually have several generations of all my imaging computers all backed up in files. So I can always restore it to a previous, to a pre previous known good. And there is free software for doing that if you want. USB issues. Is a clever little tool here called USB Device Tree Viewer. There's the URL there. It will allow you to see all sorts of information about the USB devices. In your PC, there's a USB hub as well. So the computer that I'm using has it labeled uh, these devices are on this hub and these, and these USB devices are on that hub. But when I've plugged devices into it, I could see that they were mislabeled. What I've used this for was separating all of my fast devices from all of my slow devices. And you can see when you plug something in, exactly which hub, internal hub in the PC is plugged into. I don't run USB hubs. I run everything directly to the PC. Um, create a wiring loom if you can. It's nice and easy. You have those little braided things, the very, very soft things, not, they're kind of like a nylon, very slippery. Don't use those really thick plastic things because when it gets cold, it gets very rigid. Um, that curly plastic stuff, it looks nice, but when the temperatures drop, it's going to give you a lot of grief. Velcro is good because you can change things on the fly. So those mesh cord concealers are the way to go. And um, with mine, I run... Uh, water cooling and everything through my loom and uh, it's all concealed in one of these mesh concealers and I've been doing that for oh gee getting close to 10 years now and they they've been working very well okay so this is just something I was just having a look at uh, there's a few places on the web Telescope is one you can sort of determine when objects are high. That would be good for this month. You could put in different dates to see what's coming up the next month. So you can start this whole rotation of objects. Um, they're nice because they provide a little tiny, uh, it's almost like a little bell, bell curve or something where you can see when the object will be at its highest because that, that's most important. Um, there's, you can use a whole variety of planetarium software for framing your objects, getting it all done. So you, you're going to know the exact orientation for your camera, all that stuff before you get there. You don't want to be doing this stuff in the dark. Have it all planned before you get there. If um, narrowband, Eric's a narrowband guy. Um, you could do all of your narrowband from 
a reasonably light polluted environment, but if you wanted nice stars, you could take your telescope out once a month and get some star, some star data. You could um, also do short exposures from the city. Doesn't work quite as well, but it, it can substitute. Focusing, well, I'm not a very good focuser, so I leave this task to the robots. They seem to do a much better job than I can, but they do take a bit of calibration. But once they're set up, they're going to provide reliable, consistent focusing. Do control. Well, before the Arcos, I used to image with a Newtonian. And I had do heaters on the secondary. I also had do heaters on the primary. People used to say, you're crazy. Why are you doing that? But I remember walking around in the early morning, three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And um, I could see that my images were getting soft. And one day I shone a torch down there and I could see my even my primary had dewed up. So then I investigated heaters on the primary. And now uh, I was imaging right through the morning and I would look down in the morning and the mirror is nice nice and dry no issues but before that you know, three four five six in the morning they would just do up and you can run them you just you don't have they don't, you don't have to have much temperature going into these things you just want to keep the heat off uh just keep the dew off uh be comfortable get yourself a nice uh ski suit or something uh, you can get some chemical heaters. As they're useful as well. well when we're imaging here, I know uh, I'm in southern Australia. We get, you know, we get frost and stuff on the telescopes. So if you're not moving, you're sitting in a chair. It can get a little bit uncomfortable. So dress really, really warm. A hat is very important. And hopefully, with a bit of planning, you'll be over the moon with your results. That's about it, guys. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we've had a few questions. Uh, Eric, you want to go through your list first? Uh, there was a lot of chatter about uh, what kind of batteries are best. Someone asked a question about the generator, which was kind of shot down. Uh, didn't you, you had a um, presentation on batteries a while back, didn't you, Terry? I, I did, I did. I was using something called lead carbon batteries. Now, they're uh, something you don't want to be carrying around. They're very heavy. Uh, I, I have a remote observatory out in the bush. Um, I have, it's completely off the grid, unattended, autonomous guy. I have a big solar farm out there, and I've got... 11 kilowatts of batteries but the nice thing about these is they these batteries are good for about 20 years and um, they offer about a three to one ratio for capacity over lithium batteries that's why i went with that and they also don't require active cooling lithium batteries require cooling it gets very hot out there in the summer and i didn't want anything like thermal runaway from happening so I looked at safety considerations and dollar for kilowatt. The lithium wasn't there at that point when I when I did this. Somebody but, asked whether you miss uh, film photography. I was thinking is that's kind of like missing a case of poison ivy. <laughs> I don't I don't miss film stuff because uh, you had to get it right. Focusing was hard. Like there was no feedback, was there really? And you take it to a person to get it um developed and they weren't an astrophotographer and they would throw their bias into it and it was often incorrect at the time i had somebody that worked in a film shop and they knew about astrophotography and that's where the films got developed and that helped a great deal and we are always experimenting with the you know the latest the latest types of film that we can get our hands on but the electronic stuff available today is amazing you, you know, you can make mistakes and it doesn't cost as much money as film. And while you're imaging, you can also look at your subs and saying, hey, these things don't look right. And you can, you can actually identify an issue through an imaging session. You couldn't do that with film. Mm -hmm. 
um, Eric is a remote imager. I know he likes to look at his system come alive and then investigate to see whether it's operating properly. I, I do the same. Um, at, tw um, at dusk, I'll get into my computer. I'll watch it start up. I'll look at the first one or two subs that come down. I go, yep, I'm happy. Then I just, I just let it do its thing. Film, you couldn't do that. Those are all the questions I have. You have any, uh, Alex? I want to turn on my mic. Um, yeah, I got a couple of things to say. Kara, you want to stop sharing? Uh, cause I can. Sorry. I can. I just got to okay. find that button. Where is that button? Uh, <laughs> just, anyway, I'll keep talking. Um, I, I want to point out that uh, Terry is talking about a kind of imaging program that is really, really good and really um, gets good data over a period of time. There are other kinds of, of imaging, and we were about to get into a discussion about what happens with remote imaging and what happens with, um, you know, various, there's various types of, of uh, imaging, like those batteries that he was buying for his remote observatory out in the bush are not the kinds of things you want to put into the back of your trunk and haul around. And uh, so if you're watching this YouTube show out there, please adapt everything that's been said tonight to your needs. Don't necessarily go just with um, just with the way Terry would do it. Um, for instance, Terry has been known to take years to gather sufficient amount of data to put out one of his beautiful images. There are others that have different needs. Um, I, for instance, am taking a, I want to get a snapshot. By that, I don't mean a deep, full, rich, perfect picture of each Messier object. I just want a, a nice, decent one with maybe eight or 10 hours worth of data on it. And, um, and so that, and then there's the guys that are just starting out and you really shouldn't be taking those kinds of pictures yet. You shouldn't be taking the kinds of pictures that take 10, 12, 15 hours worth of, of uh, data. You should be getting pictures. You may be taking three or four targets a night and processing that. Where are we disconnected oh, to? Oh, yeah, the, the YouTube channel has frozen. Yeah, I think I did. Alex, you broke the internet. Okay. <laughs> That's a great thing you put on your CV. Uh, just, uh, I think we're, I, I think we're back. It's working. Yeah. I can, uh, see. Yeah. We're good. There's Eric. Okay. We back. We back. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Terry was worried about breaking the internet and I broke it instead. I have, what part of my rave did you guys hear and which part did you not hear? Um, that there are other kinds of, well, was I still talking about batteries? Did you catch that before? I'm not sure where it stopped at. I'll see what the people on YouTube say in 20 seconds. Okay, let me, let me. 30 seconds of what you said, Alex. First okay. Time. Terry's program is really good for getting a good set of 10, 12, 15 hours worth of data on an object because you're getting that that data while things are at the meridian. And that's where you should be getting the data, particularly your luminant shots. Um, and, but if you're a beginning imager, what you probably want to do most of anything is to try to get as much of it as you can, as quickly as you can. And maybe you'll have three or four data sets to take home every time you, you go home from a weekend worth of imaging. Um, and so maybe you don't want to follow to Terry's recommendations quite yet until you've processed enough images that you know, you know, that that's, that's your limiting factor. Um, and um, so whatever you do, whatever you do here on this uh, advice on the internet, always tailor it for your means. Um, Terry's talk was a great inspiration for an awful lot of us over here making comments about um, ideas about how to do things better with your imaging rig. Um, the one thing that I would really add to what Terry has said is that um, do not take your imaging out rig out to the remote site to your camping trip f for your first adventure. That should take place in your backyard. 
down at your neighborhood park, your neighborhood cemetery, wherever you're going, go there with the rig, set it up, get it all working, make sure you can take pictures, do what you're supposed to do, see how long it'll last, um, image through the night on that one battery, if that's what, and see if the battery lasts. Do all that stuff before you think about taking it out camping. And then when you've got it all working so that it really does work, take all the tools that you got and pull it, put it in, Mo in Molly's tackle box. Remember Molly suggested that early on and uh, get a couple of storage bins and put everything else in the storage bins and make sure that those storage bins go with you. Another thing that I noted as far as um, making uh, setups easier for when you're going out into the bush is to um, bundle your cables together. Get your cable lengths all set up and right, and then bundle them together so that they stay together. Makes it a lot easier to set things up and take things down and keep things safe. They're all labeled, like Terry says, so they always go in the same slot on your computer. Here's a trick that you may or may not know about. Once you've focused for the night, you'll notice that your focusing tube is out a certain distance from your telescope. Well, take a big black marker and mark that position so that the next time you go out, <coughs> you have a visual cue as to where to position that focuser so that it's pretty much in focus. Now, you still have to focus, but at least you don't have to do that gross focusing where you don't even know where the star is or how it is. Um, anyway, that's that's about where we were. Um, is everybody, anybody else want to say something here? I can show, I can share a picture with some cable management of what it, my rig looks like right now. Okay. Okay. I'll try not to break the internet. Okay, Alex? My, my yeah. Turn to, my, my turn to cause havoc. Sorry about that. Oh, it, was Tolga. it was Tolga. Hey, hey, hey. We have a critical mass of, of old people that made it break. <laughs> did, did we mention someplace along the Thanks, line that we, we, <laughs> we really could use some technical expertise around here besides Tolga? And, I mean, seriously, guys, this astroimaging channel thing is put on by a bunch of guys and girls and people that are just regular old people. And uh, we could really use some people to pitch in and, and be gophers and, and help us carry things around. Okay, it looks like uh, um, Terry's got his presenting going again. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know what iteration this is because there's many generations of cable management going on here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we okay. can. So what I have here is that uh, very slippery mesh stuff that wants to curl up around itself, and it doesn't get stiff in the cold. I have one thing going to the back of my telescope because the whole from that red duvalaki, that's a rotator, that rotates from that end back. I have water, electric uh, power, USB cables. I'm driving uh, a rem remote guide head and adaptive optics unit. Uh, there's an FLI filter wheel grafted to the front of this S STL S big camera, and there's um, you can see these uh, there's tubes running in there carrying water for water cooling, that all runs down that sheath. And you'll notice that it is one loop that comes up and has a very very long section on the top, where twisting can occur. So as it does uh, as it rotates. That twisting is occurring over a long length, so it's not binding up. It's not causing a lot of uh, tension, and it it deports the telescope in one one place. That that's an older version. I've got a, a newer version, which I can't find right now. But that's that's an idea of of, uh, of cable management. Um, it, it it keeps it clean. And remember earlier where I showed that little uh, windbreak. The other good thing about the windbreak is when you have cables lying around and they're on the ground, you don't get people walking by your telescope and tripping over a cable because you've got this little crazy robot sitting inside his little little house and nobody goes in there and you're less likely to have somebody trip on something in, in the middle of the night. So it does help with a few things. Curious people poking around your telescope and, um, and wind. I'll hand it back to you, Alex, and hopefully it won't break the internet. 
Thank you. I think I've got it. Now, I can see that we've got some questions. Uh, I think we've, we've been through most of them, right? We got a couple of wise guy remarks and people have shared some things. But I, are we getting close to wrapping up for the evening? I think so. So, unless there's more to say, let me get over there real quick. Uh, yeah, I think we got it. So, um, next week, we're going to be talking about being citizen scientists again. Let me see, where, where did I go? Yeah, next week, we'll be talking about being citizen scientists again. Get my camera on. Next week, um, um, Robert Zellum is coming to tell us about how to find exoplanets with our regular astronomy gear. If you remember last week, we, we talked about uh, meteors and uh, the first part of the presentation wasn't so much about um, astroimaging on the astroimaging channel. It was a lot of really good theoretical stuff. I've seen Bob Zellum's presentation before at a club meeting at the Riverside Astronomical Society, and he's going to be talking a bit about exoplanets. So there will be some science coming next week. I know that. Uh, and then um, towards the end, he'll, sh he'll show you what you can do to contribute with scientific um, uh, analysis and uh, reporting of exoplanet research. So uh, until then, I remind you, use that contact form on the astroimagingchannel.com and so that we can get any information um, if you want to volunteer to present, if you want to volunteer to help us with some of the technical details. I promise to try not to break the internet again like I did just a minute ago. Um, but. Um, that's what we're doing, and I think we're good to go, Eric and, and Toga. I yeah, I think so. We're good. Okay, let's take us out. Bye, everybody.